first with Walker Evans, whose portrait you see here, um, a portrait of him from the 30s, as usual, give you just a, the briefest, less than a thumbnail biography of him. He grew up um, near Chicago. His father was an advertising executive. He must have been something of a handful as a child. Um, he went to Phillips Academy, and then he went to Williams College for a year, but clearly school was not for him. And his father agreed to pay for him to spend a year in Paris. So in the mid twenties, he went to Paris for a year. Um, his interest was not in art that time, but he was an aspiring writer. And uh, he took some classes at the Sorbonne, I think, attended and didn't attend. And after a year, he came back and he went to, um, to Manhattan. And he's, he, still wanting to be a writer, settled in Greenwich Village, where all progressive writers ought to be. Um, <clears throat> became a good friend of Hart Crane, of, um, let's see, John Cheever, and Lincoln Kirstein, who was one of the early movers <laughs> behind that famous mural show at the, at the Museum of Modern Art. He was instrumental in the sort of formation of the Museum of Modern Art. But also one of the people that Walker Evans met in that circle was um, Berenice Abbott. And visiting her apartment, he got to see those photographs by Eugene Ache, which had been such an inspiration for her. And that seemed to consolidate in him a desire not to become a writer, but to become a photographer. That way to record his reactions to the world around him. And uh, he did some freelance photography of the world around him, and then was hired by the Farm Security Administration in the middle of the 1930s to especially go down south to photograph the rural poor. Um, it was, again, part of that propaganda machine to, to sway people and the to support the New Deal projects. So I'll show you several of those photographs he did and then some, something, I don't know exactly what happened, uh, but he, he got a leave in um, 1936 working with, um, no, I'm not gonna remember, William Agee, and, um, the writer, and the two of them, they, they had a commission from a uh, magazine from um, Fortune magazine to go down to Alabama and to do a photo documentary and a book, well, a documentary anyway, of text and photographs on three sharecropping families, families in Alabama. Fortune ultimately didn't pick up on that. But after a few years, they produced the book, which certainly is one we had in the library system here. Let us now praise famous men. It's a very interesting book because <clears throat> the photographer and the writer go their separate ways. There's a, there's a photo essay and then there's a text. And there's a very great difference in the, the sort of the tenor of them because the text is um, a little bit overwrought by my standards, but it's very emotive and wants to bring out the heroism and the grandeur of the families. And Walker Evans there is in all his photography is famed for the kind of um, composure and the kind of space that he leaves for the subjects. So now let's look at some of them. This is his first published photography, uh, a photograph of the Brooklyn Bridge, which looks very nicely modern, modernistic, I guess you would say. And this was um, published in Hart when Hart Crane published a little book of his poem called The Brooklyn Bridge. So that's that synthesis of text and image. And then we look at ones he did early for the FSA. At first he was doing areas not so far in the deep south. He did, I think, West Virginia and Pennsylvania. And there's one thing I don't know on that enough, but I don't know about photography to say anything about how exactly he 
made the photographs, but I have read that he was extremely indifferent to the way they were printed, that he essentially just turned the negatives over to someone and said, here, do something with this. But this one here is, is just called um, a graveyard and a steel mill in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And the quality that I'm talking about, even in this, when you go from <clears throat> death into industry in this image, as you see how he just does a frontal image, you're just staring, this is all parallel to you. Um, and to me, that's, uh, I was thinking the effect that has on me, <clears throat> instead of showing these dynamic diagonals, is it's as if the image and I are, it's like, that's another face talking to me as the face. So that's like a, a different kind of an, not dramatic, but an intimate contact between the two of us. I think for other people, maybe that would be considered just dispassionate, but for me, that, that's not the way it works. And in that same campaign, this one, Joe's Auto Graveyard. You know, what an eye he has though. Look from all that detritus of all these Fords here, these rusting hulks, and then the field, and all there, there the shapes in the man-made objects, and then those wisps of barren tree branches in the background. How's that for industry versus nature? And he did many of buildings. He seems to have a, a personal affinity with them. And this is just called Houses, Atlanta, Georgia. And of course, you not only do you have houses that are care-worn creatures in themselves, but then the contrast with the glamour of the posters on, on the, that conceal them from the world. This is as simple as a Mondrian painting, isn't it? Just about as formal. If this is a Pentecostal church, there's none of that. Well, you don't even have any idea if it's used here with these boarded up windows. It's just a series of rectangles flanked by these trees. And the casual handwriting on the sign. A street scene in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Here too, you see those two men looking at us, looking at Walker Evans as we look at them. Just an um, untitled street scene. Miners' houses near Birmingham, Alabama. Now I think all of these Alabama ones were pictures made in the process of that campaign of putting something together for Fortune magazine. Just strips all the way across. The wires, the, there must be a, what, a, maybe a ditch here in the foreground behind, behind those tufts of grass that stick up. And then a strip of shadow, and then a strip of buildings, and another strip of buildings. Great formal elegance in a view that otherwise people might find not to have beauty in it. Roadside stand near Birmingham. And then this is the one I, I think for many people, probably it comes to mind if they know anything about Walker um, Evans. These are the photographs that then ultimately went into, let us now um, praise famous men. <clears throat> One of the families that um, they spent time with, actually quite a period of time, was the Burroughs family. And this is um, the title, just he gave it to us, Alabama Tenants Farmer's Wife, but it's Allie Mae Burroughs is her name. And you see, it's just a very formal portrait. Again, he's made this weathered siding. Um, 
with its horizontals behind it. Same kind of backdrop. And her very serious, straight on stare. Her mouth also another horizontal. And there's her daughter. And then the father, uh, Floyd, and the daughter, her, her name is Lucille. To, uh, in, in, in all of this, um, Evans is, 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 well, I know, this is how he's creating this feeling in me. He has those people looking directly at him, which means, of course, they are looking directly at you. And however you might think she's really casually placed there with one foot tucked behind the other ankle and she's swiveling around to the side. Look how those makes diagonals that sort of go with the diagonals of his arm. And look the way those three feet line up in uh, parallel to one another. There's um, a lot of care in this. Or this one. This is the other one of the other families that Bud Fields and his family, Hale County, Alabama. He worked with a large format camera, with a kind of an elaborate setup. But um, I almost thought, well, look at this. Do you see, he's applying the same conventions of formal photography used for the royal family, for them. They're really very similar. And then he did uh, photographs of their environment. And I don't know which family's cabin this is. It's a corner in their kitchen. It looks as spare as anything uh, Amish. I uh, have that tattered towel hanging there. It's scrubbed clean. The kind of simplicity and austerity there is something, however, this is one where we know that he um, intervened because the room where it was was so small actually that it hardly fit his whole camera setup. So he would have things rearranged in the room to suit the photograph. So you, um, it's so easy to think these are slices of life, but of course slice of life sometimes isn't as evocative. And the same with this one. That also he set up. Just so that you don't see the window, but you get the wonderful light streaming in from the back. Cuts it with that drapery and the towel here. I'll only show you two more. He went on after the war. He also did color photography. He had a, a long career, and there's a lot of variety in a long career, but still staying in the 30s. Let me show you another, two other from his experimentation toward the end of the decade. He uh, worked with a pinhole camera that he concealed under his coat, and so he would be riding the subway, and the people on the subway would have no idea that he was photographing them. And this is just subway passengers. It uh, didn't get published until the mid-60s. Look, um, doesn't that bring to mind what you saw last time with Reginald Marsh and the, the three people sitting on the, well, two seated and one standing on the subway car? And here's one more from that. The 
same subway series. Well, with all the photographers, I most vehemently urge you to go on Google Images and start scrolling through the multitudes there because I've just pared these down brutally and they are wonderful. So then we go on to Dorothea Lang, who's um, knew from the time she was in high school she wanted to be a photographer. And as different as chalk and cheese from Walker Evans, although she too is documenting the poor and also for the FSA. But, um, she, um, where was she born? Hoboken, I believe. But she grew up on the Lower East Side. And I'm telling you some factors that I think they surely had some effect on her art. Her, her, um, her father abandoned the family when she was an adolescent. And she herself had also had polio and always had a limp to remind her of that. So she faced some degree of poverty and adversity in her own life. But after she finished college, she and a friend uh, must have been high spirited and definitely had gutsy women. They were going to go around the world and they made it as far as San Francisco when someone robbed them of everything. So they had to stop. And she established her own uh, photo studio there and she did uh, portraits. And I think they were very, very nice portraits. And um, she soon married a painter named Maynard Dixon and had two children. Oh dear, here one of the cats is coming. <clears throat> this is, um, so I didn't bring in any of her um, society photographs, but this is one of, of the hands of her, one of her children, Dan, and her husband, Maynard. So I think already you can see she's going to be interested in something other than the hope moaned, the, the fashionable um, people of, of San Francisco, but she has this really strong humanistic bent. And what she said was that when, uh, when, when on the second floor in her studio in San Francisco, she would look out on the street and see the derelicts and feel that she just didn't know enough about part of that, that part of the world and she should know more. She began to photograph from her window and then to go out on the street and photograph. And this is a photograph that um, cemented her new career. It's called a White Angel Breadline and from 1933. So a White Angel, there was a nickname given to a woman who uh, owned, um, who ran this, this um, breadline. And she took this picture, which is, of course, not just a sea of men in their caps, but one fellow who turns away as if he's either, well, whatever, he's just not part of the crowd. Um, <clears throat> and with that, she came to the attention of other photographers. And she had an exhibition of her work in 1934 where she met her subsequent husband, um, who was a, a professor of economics at, at UCLA. And he was very interested in documenting the plight of the rural poor, but especially of the so-called Okies, those farmers who'd lost their land during the Dust Bowl and were going out west, hoping to find work there. And <clears throat> so um, she was to go along as a research photographer, and then he was collecting economic data and life stories from them. Her, the photography went further afield than just the migrants once they entered California. This is a, a, sometime in the 30s, one of her photographs of what the Dust Bowl was doing, where there was nothing for any of these farmers. My own family background was of people who lived through the Dust Bowl, so yeah, it was really awful.
And then the photograph known above all others by her, as, of course, is the migrant worker. Uh, she was um, not yet working for the, was she? I think she had just begun to work for the government. But anyway, she was still also working for the state of California and their resettlement um, of, of migrants. And she, because this photograph is very famous, she talked about it later on, how she had been out and she saw a sign to a sign of a, a migrant workers camp. And she drove on and then she came back and then she went in and she saw this family. Now, I think I'm going to read to you what something she said, but it has to me the quality of something that's recollected much later from the, from the fact. Um, she said, I saw and approached the hungry and desperate mother as if by a magnet. Now, this woman's name is Florence Owens Thompson. I do not remember how I explained my presence or my camera to her, but I do remember she asked me no questions. I made five exposures, working closer and closer from the same direction. I did not ask her name or her history. She told me her age. She was 32. She said they had been living on frozen vegetables from the surrounding fields and birds that the children killed. She just sold the tires from her car to buy food. There she sat in that lean-to tent with her children huddled around her and seemed to know that my pictures might help her, so she helped me. There was a sort of equality about it. Well, this is one thing for which Dorothea Lange was quite well known is that she would um, exchange uh, conversation, sort of setting sometimes the, her subjects at ease. And she is most interested in the human subjects. But I, I have not only this famous one, but some of the others from these four, these five that she took. But that is so thoroughly a Madonna image. And there's her lean to tent. And then, of course, where she go back here? And when she finally moves in, I think. This was published under a headline in the San Francisco newspaper called, What Does the New Deal Mean to This Mother and Her Children? Essentially nothing, right? Because they're, they're still suffering from complete poverty. So uh, that very day, the government acted, and they rushed food supplies out to that camp. So her, she was a, always, her goal was a kind of a social activism. Here's another one she did in that same camp, or at least of some, just some okay children in a migratory camp. Well, I read somewhere a nice formulation of, of what she does, which is to take the specific and find in it the universal. Here's another one for which the, the caption um, was available. This is the family between Dallas and Austin. The people have left their home and connections in South Texas and hope to reach the Arkansas Delta for work in the cotton fields. Penniless people, no food and three gallons of gas in the tank. The father is trying to repair a tire. Three children, father says, it's tough, but life's tough anyway, you take it. This one, Oklahoma migrant stranded in California desert. These are ones she took in San Francisco in 1937. Um, this Howard Street in San Francisco, which is the Skid Row area. So you have this just this row of men. 
I think the Salvation Army headquarters was down the block from this. So that's a kind of a distanced view, but wait till you look at this one. It's the same street. So um, she took many photographs. Um, and she, you see, she's more, um, yeah, so she ventures more in, in close ups, distant views, angled views, straight on, um, a, lot, a lot of variety. Tractored out. This is the land in Texas, which couldn't grow a weed. Yeah, that takes some planning, but at what angle so that you get the house just at the right place on that horizon? You have to have the sun at the right angle to get the slanting shadows. This was just in the New Yorker review of the show that you're now not able to see at, at the Museum of Modern Art, but which you can see a lot of the image from online. Um, and this is called Woman of the High Plains, Texas Panhandle. Now these, these are later, this is 1939. Um, this is an unemployed lumber worker who goes with his wife to the bean harvest in Oregon. We're gonna be looking at other works from 1939. And remember 1939 is the year World War II broke out. And the last one is going back, a, well, same year. This is one of the migrant camps um, that, that the government created in California. It's called the Shafter Camp. This neat and tidy, must have been like heaven on earth for them. You see, surrounded by the fields. Then um, I'll just tell you, that then she got a, a Guggenheim for her photography, but she essentially didn't, follow up on that project at all. Uh, what she went into of her own volition is something you should seek out. She um, getting wind of the internment of the Japanese Americans in camps in the West, went out and photographed them. Um, the wonderful photographs, but the government was not, did not allow those to be published for decades. Um, later on, she taught photography. She founded a photography magazine and died just before there was a retrospective of her work at MoMA in 1965. Well, with some chagrin, we said goodbye to the photographers. Oh my goodness. If you idle around on your computer, looking at, so we're going to look at Thomas Hart Benton and Grant Wood. If you look at, at the articles written about them, you will still find peons of praise and people who just vilify them as terrible second rate artists, con jobs. So these are people who, <laughs> Who provoke a lot. So Grant Wood is the, these are the true regionalist artists. Um, there were three, uh, we'll just look at two, who were um, especially famous. Grant Wood, Thomas Hart Benton, and a man named um, um, John Stuart Curry. Grant Wood um, grew up in Iowa, died in Iowa, spent a lot of his life in Iowa, but not all of it. Uh, Thomas Hart Benton is from Missouri, um, not all his life in Missouri either. And uh, John Stuart Curry grew up in Kansas, but lived a lot of time in an artist colony in, in Connecticut and did other things and then went back to, to Kansas. 
the reason they're grouped together is that they were in an exhibition, um, a regional exhibition in the Midwest that was picked up by the press and got amplified through the Manhattan Press by the editors of Time Life, particularly I think Time Magazine, who really did not like modern art and the New York art scene and were exultant that there was something else going on. They said, ah, this is real American art. You know, everything we've been looking at is about what is American? What makes American art? All that's the preoccupying theme. Okay, so well, now we take, here he is in his publicity shot. Uh, I'm assuming some of you saw the ex exhibition of his work at the Whitney um, two years ago, um, where we see that he was more than just the, um, the American Gothic, but he is a, a wily and pretty enigmatic character, I think. Maybe he was a good painter sometimes, maybe sometimes not. Yeah, I know you'd have all said, oh, I recognize that's a Grant Wood. And it is. In the 20s, he spent, he spent he, um, a lot of time. He made four trips to Europe. He studied in Paris. Uh, he spent a year studying in Germany, especially stained glass making there. And the art that he came back, he, he'd gone to school at the Chicago Art Institute, um, to, to their art school. But um, what he came back from those years with was a kind of like a, what was already then quite passe, uh, sort of impressionist style, sort of the bright color of fauvism, this thick, freely painted work like this. Or here, painting of calendulas that he did. I'm going to say something that's just really denigrating, but sorry, I'm going to say it. It looks like something that you could see in really good street art fairs now, right? This is art that is very, I mean, I'd give anything to be able to paint like this, but this is art that is very pleasing and sells well. And he worked in this way for about 10 years, um, up until the late 20s. Uh, he also was in fact involved in other areas. He'd been trained partly in metalworking. He did some silversmithing. He did some jewelry making. He did some stage design. He did some interior decoration. Uh, it's kind of moving around, but, but he's back in, in near Cedar Rapids where, where he lived um, doing this. It seems to have been the trip he made in 1928 to Europe that made a big difference in what he did. Oh, I think I'm going to even forget about that one. Oh, no. What? But from about 1929 on, there's an, a, a, an extreme shift in what he does to a style that's very meticulous, very detailed, very somewhat primitive looking, um, and totally focused on the Midwest. The, for some of the curators in the um, Whitney show in the recent biography of him are, are suggesting a lot of this is because of his um, uh, res repressed homosexuality, which was, would be not welcomed in the area where he grew up at all. But, um, that the fact that the work he was doing before was one that was pleasing to women. It's as if he then wanted something of sterner stuff, but that's speculation. Uh, this one is a, a, it's a more drawing than a painting. He did in the mid 1930s, it was going to accompany his memoir, which he did not finish. It was called My, um, My Bohemia. Oh, no, I'm not going to give that to you wrong here. Return from Bohemia. 
that he's, it's like he's, he's renouncing that Bohemian art style, the Parisian art style of before, uh, that his hijinks in Paris are never mentioned. Uh, and, and now he's going to the sobriety of, of the Midwest. And these would be as if his ancestors look at him. Um, and you just can't believe a word of this. This barn behind him, oh, here's something he said. All the good ideas I've ever had came to me while I was milking a cow. He never milked a cow in his life. So what he says about any of his art has to be taken with um, a tablespoon of salt. And this way that he presented himself. We'll look at this painting as a moment too. In his, well, uh, in the farm where, area where I grew up, those are called overhauls, but his, his overalls. That is so much a disguise, a costume, a posture. Uh, here he is with, John, I love this. Here he is with John Stuart Curry. And don't you know, they're both having so much fun. They know this is a great send up. Uh, neither one of these guys is a local yokel farmer. <clears throat> but here they are doing the pose. This is the one of the first paintings he did in this new style. Um, it's called uh, Just a Woman with Plants, and it's actually a portrait of his mother, with whom he lived for very many years. Um, the kind of abraded quality it looks like in this painting is true. He's painting on masonite, sort of like on a slick woody surface, which made it a little bit like Flemish, um, so-called primitives, like the time of Jan van Eyck. And those were the paintings he was drawn to then. He, in his last trip to, to, um, to Germany, and then I guess he went to Flanders, I think he went as well, he saw this kind of extraordinary, meticulous uh, painting style, and that just resonated with him. Maybe that craftsman-like tendency that was deep in him as well. And uh, so he begins to ex apply, a, create a technique that's a little like their painting on wood, and then also this kind of extraordinary precision. So he's just on the border of it here with this, here with his mother, and then the landscape is, the trees are almost gonna be Grant Wood trees here, not quite getting there. Look at the emphasis on the wear of her hands. So that's his new take on being American. It's a 19th century America, a simple America. At the same time, Charles Sheeler is looking at this is the early America for him, but seen through modern eyes. He's not reviving a style that's of a bygone era as well. But you can kind of wonder about Grant Wood's style. I'll show you some more in a moment that you see, but okay, so here we are. I, I don't know how many of you have been tossing in your bed at night when you're not worrying about the virus, worrying about whether this is a, a send off or if, or if this is a, a, a laudatory uh, scene. That's his sister Nan and his dentist in this photograph, uh, this painting. It's, um, the idea actually came from the house behind it, which is from another small town outside Cedar Rapids in a place called Eldon, Iowa. And that just seized uh, Wood's imagination. And he asked these two figures to pose for him. He, um, according to his sister, uh, asked her to pose in a certain way that she would pull down the features of her face. Because let me show you what she looked like. He did this, this is another portrait he, he did of his sister. But here toward the end of his life, um, he died young when he was 51, but there's his sister in the back. He asked her, could she pull her features down like that? And he showed her some illustrations of Gothic, um, figural sculpture with the long faces on them. And supposedly she said, well, she knew lots of neighbors who looked like that regularly, but, 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 but uh, he said, no, that they, they would be offended. So he, he, he wanted a certain kind of facial type, this, this long and very severe face. 
And you see, here's his mother's uh, cameo and a similar uh, apron that she's wearing. This is as carefully calculated a painting in just formal qualities. Like if you look at the tines of that worn pitchfork, how that's exactly the same pattern on his faded dungarees. Small stud, large cameo. Um, that tree, her hair, that curve through here. She's on the side where it's a plant. There's something domestic. He's on the side where the barn is. Um, you can actually take it through even smaller. She has one curl escaping here, as opposed to the total severity over here. This pattern here, this pattern there. This as opposed to this. Gertrude Stein said about this painting, or well, said about Grant Wood upon seeing this painting, um, that all artists and all art movements ought to be afraid of, of Grant Wood because he was such a wicked satirist. And Grant Wood, at different times in his career, said that this was one done to honor and ennoble these farming people, and at other times said that he's, yes, he was mocking them. And there are some other works he does that are ambivalent, and some it's very clear he's satirical. Uh, anyway, so the fate of this painting, he, it, I told you that he'd gone to um, art school at the School of Art at the Chicago Art Institute. And they annually had a uh, show, a juried show of American um, painting and sculpture. And he submitted this in 1930. Evidently, there was some initial disagreement about the judges, whether it would be accepted. But it was, and it won a bronze medal and a $300 prize. And 300 was quite a lot of money. And somehow it also got picked up in the press and was photographed. So people saw this from coast to coast, and that immediately made his fame. Oh, there's the house. And there's the dentist and his sister. So what was the other source for that painting? Well, it's Flemish art like the Arnolfini altarpiece from 1434. You see the long face there? So that's going to the, be the beacon for him for, the, for a kind of style from now on. And then the same year he did this one called Stone City, Iowa. It was a town just very near where he lived. <sighs> what an amazing thing. And my, you're going to find different opinions on this. Uh, Stone City was a town that had been kind of a boom town because there were limestone quarries here and that limestone was used in making um, cement. But then Portland cement was developed and they didn't need that limestone anymore. And this town went bust. It, it, was, it was just completely gutted. And that was in... The, that's the state it was in, in Wood's lifetime. But that's not the way he paints it. He paints it in this kind of absolute vision of some, these great rolling hills and the neat arrangement of the trees and um, just the suggestion of complete prosperity here. Look how tidy and the nice cow casting a shadow there. A few chickens down here, one farmer one equestrian figure. There's often little bits of detail, like a Flemish painting. It invites you to look way back here. Windmill, go back here, bit by bit. Um, let's see if I have the size of this to tell you. Oh yeah, it's 30 by 40 inches. So you, the details are not all that small. But where, where's the other source of inspiration for this painting? 
not just Flemish art. But he talked very open. It's, it's well, I grew up calling this um, blue and white wear, but uh, the English name for it is, is willow wear. It's, it's sort of a, it's a Western creation from the late 18th century on, but uh, it's, it's blue and white um, ceramics. And the, here's the willow tree. This is a characteristic element, the willow tree and the bridge and the trees. Look at that. His mother had a set of that. And he said that's the source of his, that was the enchantment for him that then is the source of these trees. Now, there's a reading of this is all a very gay image, these being male buttocks back here. There's also a traditional reading that whenever there are hills in a landscape, that those are a woman's belly or a woman's breasts. So you can go wherever you want to with this. I'll tell you where he went with it. Uh, he, he sent this um, to, uh, text after this. He sent this to the first director of the Whitney Museum because he's flush with that, that um, achievement of that, the winning, prize winning of the American Gothic. So he sent this in another uh, painting um, to, um, and this is the text, oh, I think, oh, he wrote. Um, she said, I'm working diligently, but paintings in the style of the American Gothic and Stone City necessarily take considerable time in the making. He sent this in a portrait to the Whitney. But this is what the director of the Whitney wrote back later in typed note. His was very sort of careful penmanship. It is our unanimous opinion not to purchase them at this time, but we'll consider again including one of your paintings in our collection. I am returning the two pictures to you express prepaid. Thank you again. Well, that's all right. Catherine Hepburn bought them. Edgar G. Robinson bought them. John Marquand bought them. There are a lot of people bought them. This is what that area looks like. Those are the real trees, not the Grant Wood trees. So sure. No, I have to choose just a couple here. Let's see which one. Yeah, I'll give you this one. This is um, the birthplace of Herbert Hoover. Well, you know, that's a predecessor to FDR. And uh, Hoover uh, was born in, in Iowa, but uh, this also I know from family history, um, <clears throat> there great animosity toward Hoover and part of the Midwest. And so there was a great praise for Herbert Hoover. And um, this is 1931. Look at this, it's almost like a hallucinate, hallucinatory view. It's this careful view down here. This is where Herbert Hoover was born. So some local Cedar Rapids businessmen hired, um, commissioned Grant Woods to do this painting as a gift to Herbert Hoover, who rejected it because it, too much minimized his, his birthplace and too much emphasized this house here. But look at this same kind of like, look at those trees. Look at this, each oak leaf and oaks. Did you guess this? This, this was one for a, a coffee shop in a, Cedar Rapids Hotel. These are the mid thirties. And especially wanted to make sure we got this one. The Daughters of the Revolution. This is from 1930, 32. And it's almost 40 inches across. And it's just these three women. You notice one is holding Oh, so carefully, so delicately, so self-consciously, a willow wear cup. And what's in the painting here, back here is, of course, that's Washington Cross in the Delaware that you 
you see in the map. Well, these are three women of the DAR. And this is one where he is intentionally satirizing them. And the satire probably just went over the heads of very many people. <clears throat> because the time he was in, um, in 28, he spent in Germany, was learning to do stained glass windows because he had a commission for a memorial chapel. And he came back and the, he wanted to hire German stained glass workers. And the DAR objected to this because the, this, is, this is, you know, they're isolationists up the wazoo. They didn't want German workers coming into the Midwest. <clears throat> so here he's painting the scene a few years later. This is his revenge. So you have these very prim and proper ladies and a very American scene, but this American scene is painted by Emanuel Leutz, who was a German immigrant. So Grant Wood is a, he, 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 he's, he's a sly son of a gun. This one's spring turning, extraordinary detail here. This is about 40 inches across also. You can even see back to a small bit here. So the plowing is going on here in this field, in this field. Let's see a little bit back here. The clouds take the same rectangular patterns that you see in the fields. So it's extremely abstract for an artist who's eschewing all modern art. This is extraordinarily modern. Here are two details. This one called Parson Weems' Fable. This is uh, the last one we'll look at from him. Um, this is 1939, and it's um, 30 inches by 50 inches. Parson Weems, that's the nickname of this man, who's the one who was the first biographer of George Washington and is the one who invented the story about George Washington at six years old, chopping down a cherry tree. And when his father accuses him, he says, I cannot tell a lie. I'm the one who did it. <clears throat> well, you see how uh, Grant Wood's theatricality shows up here. That this is as if the curtain is being pulled back on this scene. And it's extraordinarily theatrical and utterly stylized. Look at the mound here. Look, <clears throat> yeah, this curve and oh, look at the tassels, which will be just like the cherries we see in the tree and hanging from the tea, or like the buttons on his jacket. We'll see it even back here. So with that smile, that smile, smile, he's looking at us. He's pointing to this scene. Of course, it's, it's known. This is a fabricated story. He's saying, you know, I invented this story. Then let, let's look at a couple of these details I'm going to show you. This, I think I've got two others. Now, as Parson Weems told the story, the father was extraordinarily forgiving of, of George Washington. But this man is extremely stern, not only way too large and overbearing and accusatory with his arm, but look how neatly that arm goes, arm goes, arm goes, arm goes, arm goes, arm. Goes arm. Oh, this is such a clear, abstract, laid out composition. <clears throat> this really illustrates Grant Wood's relationship to his father. But look at that head. Look what he's used for a head. That's Gilbert Stewart's portrait of the adult George Washington. Isn't that a wonderful tree? a styrofoam ball, isn't it? Then I'm going to show you this in a bit. Um, you see how careful he is with the shadows. <laughs> he's, he's, oh, imagine doing all those tufts of grass. He would, as Thomas Hart Benton did, sometimes make um, little clay models of the figures to see that he would get the, the cast shadows just, um, get them just absolutely right. This background section. Uh, 
uh, not at all subtle reference to the fact that Judge Washington kept slaves all his life long. So that undercuts the story to the, the laudatory story of the whole painting. So his work is really provocative. And there's, there's some suggestion by more than one author that this dark cloud coming in here is, um, uh, would be, be an understood rec uh, reference to this is the uh, clouds of war coming. But this is for, um, to, to bolster Americans' pride in their own country, to just um, consolidate the American ethos. Um, none of that vile, uh, contaminated by foreigners that, like the East Coast. And then so quickly, just a little from Thomas Hart Benton. Here's his portrait in 1934, which was on the cover of Time magazine. Because it's time that pushes these men, that this is the true American art. And they called him a, a hero of American art. Thomas Hart Benton himself came from a political family. Grandfather was a senator, his father was a congressman. He was involved in hearing political arguments all his life long. He too spent time studying in Europe and he spent 20 years teaching art in New York City. So he, it's, it's a construct to call him a Midwesterner, although that's where he went back. And it's a construct that he accepted because this sold very well. He's got <laughs> the popular press behind him. And the only thing that makes me say, oh, okay, well, you're not gonna get to see much about him because I know you will, you will, if you haven't before, when you get to go back to the map, I want to see the room that has a, just the frescoes, 10 panels he did. Um, it, it's called, um, let me the exact right title, um, America Today, done in 1930. He did this for this new school of social research um, down on West 12th Street, which was the, uh, was later, two years later, it's called the College of the Immigrants um, uh, or, or Scholars in Exile. It was the most progressive organization, uh, educational organization in Manhattan. And this was for the boardroom. Uh, this was done in 1930, and I'll show you just a little of this so you get the sense of what his style is like. Uh, as I say, there's going to be people enthusiastic about it, and some just like can barely open their eyes to look. Um, because it is true that he is playing to the public. He wants this art to reach people. Then why shouldn't art? That's what the photographers are doing. You want to get the public. Uh, and this is about the state of um, different industry in different parts of the country. I'll just give you a couple of the panels. Oh, I should say, he started out, he lived in Fort Lee because he, he made, um, this, this is toward the end of the 30s, this, this one he does. Uh, he worked for uh, movies. He made stage sets for black and white. But there is something so thoroughly theatrical in his art. So this is back to the one from um, America today. So I, I have been thinking more about the, just as Ben Shan's murals and murals we've seen before, this abrupt shift in style, size makes sense because if you had something that was thoroughly illusionistic, that would be as if there were no wall there. And you need to be reminded there's a wall. So it, consistent perspective is somewhat meaningless or it goes against the purpose of the art. <clears throat> this has tremendous dynamism in this all. This is the city, um, city streets and city at night. So you have the subway. Oh, here's a city lighted the trolleys back here, fighting extremely brazen dancing up here. 
no, Tom, uh, Reginald Marsh was a good friend of his. And this characteristic um, figure style, these elongated, very muscular figures for which I believe always he made clay little maquettes of them. He would, he would um, have a whole series of sketches, then he would do the whole composition, then he would make clay models, and then he would paint from the clay models. Oh, it's the wrong place for me to say it's super accessible, but it's, 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 it is. So all sorts of different activities. Here, this is a, down the south. Of course, it's, he's even showing a chain gang in here. And the pile up of the clay, of the cotton, the steamboat. Midwest farming, lumberjacks here, granaries. I don't know where this is exactly supposed to be. But it's full of incident to the nth degree. And uh, industry is a, is a peon to industry and human labor, because what human labor I've done this almost to the moment. I want to get to this. Oh. this one. Steel mills. You know who that is? That's Jackson Pollock. Based on Renaissance art, Giambologna. And there's Jackson Pollock. Look at this face. There he is. So he, like Reginald Marsh, calls on Renaissance art as much as modern art to do this and, and conceals us in this um, populist inspiring imagery. Uh, it's a long place from where we started, although we're still back in 1930. Um, and our time is over. So I will, as usual, I'll turn off the recording, but Um, no. Stop the screen sharing. And it could take conversation. Now, I was going to find where to turn off that, but I don't see it. So you are all on uh, Any questions you have? You can try again. Maggie, I have one. Um, no, I lost it. Um, oh, the the painting by Wood, um, the the farm scene that shows the willow care, the, the willow wear. Yeah. What was the name of that painting? The the first one that had the um, the farm, the bridge. Oh, with the farm. The farm. <laughs> Not the one with all the green. No, it was the, 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 the hills and the little details. See me. I'm on, I don't have my video on. It was fall plowing, but I don't, spring turning, I think it's the one you need. Okay, that's close enough. Thanks. Some of those people are the ones that go to a house all the time. So they have a real intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. Anything more? Are we saying a happy, happy, happy June and see some of you in um, July? Maybe. Oh. Okay. In July. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you so much, Maggie. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Thank you. What is your topic? Here. Uh, July. July is going to be. The Lives and Loves of the Gods. Oh, so they take oh. painting and sculpture from the whole Western tradition, and it's a, a Greek classical gods. So. Oh, Greek classical. And it'll go up through Picasso that way. Wow. <laughs> Sounds great. Okay. See you then. Yeah. Oh, hi.
Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maggie. I have a newfound appreciation of photography and of Grant Wood. Yeah, he's a, um, he's a strange one. I, I, I just never got into his work, but now I really appreciate it so much more. Thank you so much. And Benton, too. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye. So long. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.